right? <laughs> oh, I knew this would be fun. What a turnout. So what are the ticket prices too high? Thank you very much. All right, folks, let's shatter the suspense once and for all. That's for one, CBS rumors are actually true. Tom Snyder will be the host of the Late Late Show. Um, oh, we are naturally, all of us at CBS, delighted, and yes, it is true that it was David Letterman's idea. We had at an earlier date considered a variety of bizarre options. That's what uh, network weasels actually do for a living. We know the network, how many network executives does it take to screw in a light bulb? I don't know what you think. Does it have to be a light bulb? That's what we do for a living. David, um, once David suggested Tom Sider, despite what you've heard, we immediately ditched the idea of anything else and uh, never again talked to anyone else, never discussed with anyone else. I had lunch with Tom Snyder on April the 20th. He ate chicken, um, a small dose of soup, and, uh, and a lot of fruit, and he met Larry Tish for the first time. And we all concluded that uh, David was, as usual, absolutely right. Tom was the man. We have, um, I think, selected a remarkable broadcaster whose range and versatility are even less of a secret than this announcement. And one of the reasons we've done that is there is no substitute for intelligence, experience, and quality to succeed on this network and to follow David Letterman, a tough job in itself. Television is awash with talkers, but short on great listeners. It's awash with celebrities, but short on substance. So Tom is a Renaissance man, we think, with an insouciance that connects him directly to Dave. We'll look that up later, Tom. You certainly will. <laughs> Too. <laughs> uh, in our case, Two's Company and Late Night, um, and I think these are two for our future for a long time, and uh, I couldn't be more delighted. And now I'll ask the, the man for all our seasons, and particularly uh, for the last 12 months, the extraordinary David Letterman. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Howard. Yeah, Give you an idea how important a gathering, actual ice water, ladies and gentlemen. I was, uh, I was just, uh, I'm still kind of amused at something Howard uh, told me before we came out here. <laughs> he, was, he was explaining to me uh, earlier how the uh, loss of uh, NFL football really wouldn't hurt the network. <laughs> Still enjoying kind of a chuckle over that one. <laughs> We've been here in the uh, Ed Sullivan Theater for almost one year. It'll be a couple of weeks we will have been here, started our brand new show at CBS one year ago, August 29th, 1993, and shortly we'll have completed somewhere over 200 shows one year. Tonight, I'm announcing that I have decided to return to NBC. <laughs> They have a spot open for me immediately following Greg Kinnear, and I, I, could, I couldn't be happier. Thank you very much for your thoughts, your prayers, and your blessings. In 1971 or two, I was working at a television station in Indianapolis, Indiana. Then it was the ABC affiliate, WLWI, Channel 13. And one of my responsibilities there was to work as the booth announcer. And every half hour, every hour, I would do public service announcements, I would read commercials, I would mention the call letters of the station, give the time, introduce the news, so on and so forth, and, and log all of the commercial spots that ran. And because I was a kid and because I was just out of college, my working day began around four in the afternoon, and if everything went all right, I would be done by about 12.30 or 1, 1 12.45, and I, I would be home a little bit after one and it was in those days frustrating because uh, there was no cable TV there was no satellite really and there was just three stations in Indianapolis and and uh, two of them had signed off my station of course and uh, the CBS station uh, w which then had uh, nothing on at night um, 
We fixed that, didn't we, Howard? <laughs> I should say, uh, I will. And uh, I, I got to go home, and, and the only thing that was on television in those days at night was uh, the Tomorrow Show, which followed the, the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. It came on the air about, I believe, 1 a.m. And I think I saw the, the first show that Tom Snyder did from, from Burbank. Tom sitting there in a chair, uh, talking right to the camera. And as you know, the impression you get when a man is doing that is that he is talking right to you. And immediately, I recognize this as being a very smart, very resourceful, very natural communicator and broadcaster. And I believe, as I've told Tom over the years, I probably am one of those people who saw 80, 85 percent of all of the television shows he did as the Tomorrow Show. And then things come and go as they do, and uh, I packed up my pickup truck and moved to Los Angeles and uh, was lucky enough through, I guess, some mistakes and misfortunes and, and just, as I mentioned, dumb luck to be offered a, a television program that was called Late Night, which replaced uh, Tom's show there at NBC. There, it had on, undergone some changes, um, sort of dramatic changes in, in the, the format, and uh, Rona Barrett. And, uh, <laughs> and for one reason or another, through mishandling, mismanagement, Tom was let to slip away from, uh, from NBC. And as we started our television program in uh, February of, was it 80? February of 81 or something? 82. 82. Thanks, Tom. You're welcome. Don't ever correct me again in public. <laughs> uh, what have I done? The, the, most, the most trepidation that I felt beginning that new project was that there would be no Tom, that people would be disturbed, that people would miss Tom, uh, and, and that was my biggest ongoing fear, that we had bumped somebody who had established for himself a natural position not only in broadcasting but in the uh, popular culture of the day. And from, from that job, Tom, I guess, worked at uh, Channel 7 in, here in New York City and, and then ended up doing a, a very entertaining radio show for three, four years, Tom? I don't want to correct you, sir. Yeah. And, and I, I believe that, again, I listened to nearly every one of, of those shows and, and through it all, and up now to and continuing on his uh, television program at CNBC, uh, I, I always found the, the man first and foremost entertaining. Uh, I, I found him intelligent, and I found him, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a gifted broadcaster and communicator, which is endlessly appealing to me. Uh, so now, uh, if you think in these terms, for me in a, in a small measure, uh, we have come full circle here. And we are able to afford Tom a position which I think he has earned and certainly deserved, which is to be, once again, a fixture uh, on network television. Ladies and gentlemen, here's my good friend, Tom Snyder. Thank Tom, you. stand up and stand up and take a bow. Tom, Tom Snyder! Ladies and gentlemen, Tom Snyder! You know, I just have the feeling that my leg has really been pulled here, Dave, you know. <laughs> Jeez. Anyway, thanks, folks, for coming over here. I, 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 you know, this is truly incredible. Uh, you know, a year ago, this was no more in my mind than it would be to jump off the top of the Empire State Building, and all of a sudden, here we are tonight. And I just, uh, I want to thank all of you in the press. I mean, you and I have been together for a long time in radio and television. And since this first appeared, I believe, in Mr. Bean Cooley's column in the Daily News back in January or February of this year, uh, most of you have written about this idea, and, and thank you for saying it seems like a pretty good idea. Uh, not all of you agree, and that's okay, and I hope that once we get on the air, you'll give us a chance. But really, I've read the articles that you've written about this idea, and about Dave, and about me, and about CBS, and I'll tell you, 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 you have truly floored me with your kindness to me, and I want you all to know that I truly appreciate that. I thank Mr. Stringer and Mr. Tish for their kindness to me and listening to me, for David Letterman, for his friendship. And there are only two reasons that I leave the very comfortable quarters at CNBC. And by the way, I thank those people there, Roger Ailes and, and uh, Tom Rogers and Andy Friendly and the other people at CNBC who have been most gracious and, and, and kind to me. 
in allowing me to listen to Mr. Tish and to Mr. Stringer and to Morty and to Peter LaSalle about this project called The Late Late Show. And so I thank them for that. And, and as I told them, the only reason, you know, I'm not doing this for the money, and I'm not doing it to go back on the network. I'm doing it for two reasons. The first reason is late night broadcasting at CBS. I, I've loved late night since I did it back in the 70s at NBC. And the second reason is the profound friendship and respect that I have for Mr. David Letterman, who's been kind to me and a stand-up friend for going on 15 years now. You know, I think David Letterman was on The Tomorrow Show back in the 1970s with Meryl Marco and with uh, Harry Shearer, as I recall, and there was somebody else there. Billy that, Crystal. Billy Crystal, I think. And it was he who changed my life when Brandon Tartikoff called me into his office one day in late 1981 and said, we have come to an agreement with David Letterman. So I, I thank him for his friendship and his kindness, and I thank you all for the nice things you've written about me, and we will all be pleased to answer any questions you have. Thank you, folks. I didn't introduce Peter Todorisi. If there's anyone in the room who doesn't know who Peter Todorisi is, that's Peter Todorisi looking smooth, a recent father. So be nice to nice him, Peter. Nice. And of course, Peter LaSalle, another Peter, and of course, the indefatigable Robert Morton. Thank you. <laughs> now, now it's worth the cab ride, ain't it? Uh, Tom, when does the new show start? Uh, in wintertime, uh, late winter this year. You know, we just put this together recently, and if you look at what I do for CNBC and what I did for NBC uh, pre-David Letterman, uh, that basically is what I do, and that, if I have a strength, it is that, in being able to conduct conversations that are informing and entertaining with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And in the conversations that I've had here with uh, Robert Morton and Peter LaSalle, I don't see that changing very much. Uh, what you see on CNBC in terms of an 800 telephone number, in terms of this being a live program at 12.35 a.m., uh, in terms of it being simulcast on the CBS radio network, I think it make it, will make it a very exciting broadcast. But I think the basic core of that, of that show will be Tom and the, the people that were lucky enough to get to come in the studio out in Los Angeles at 9.30 at night. Thank you very much, folks, good night. <laughs> Now, when, when they say you're uh, late winter, does that mean they're letting you out of your contract early uh, at CNBC, or do you have a, a start date at all? Uh, well, it's early December. We, are, I, we haven't got a specific date, but it will be before Santa Claus. Before which, sir? Santa Claus. Oh, very good, yeah. <laughs> Tom, you've, uh, you've talked to so many people over your, your long career. Is there anybody left interesting to talk to, and if there is, who are they? No, they're all... <laughs> We've done them all. There, there are people that we probably haven't even heard of yet. I mean, you know, people a year and a half, two years ago, who was Heidi Fleiss? Uh, a year and a half, two... Oh, you know who she was, Tom. Um, <laughs> come on. You, you knew. Come on. Please, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what have I done for <laughs> You're starting already. <laughs> I never should have put you on back in the 70s. I, well, I left you outside, you know. And especially with David, do you think that, you know, that trend of younger is better has been a little bit misguided? As far as, like, host, everybody seems to be, like, under 25, the MTV generation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the question is directed to whom, ma'am? Um, David, and then, you know, I'd like you to respond to oh, it. As, as does far experience as, count? Uh, I think experience certainly does count. Uh, uh, I, I think it's uh, good and bad that television is one area where you, you don't need experience to get a high-powered position. <laughs> uh, but, it, it, uh, and, and I don't know how you view me, but, you know, I'm, I'm 47 years old, and uh, um, I, I don't look at Tom as being a, a guy who's however old Tom is. I just, I just look at him and have always looked at him as somebody who's very good at what he does. Uh, and that's the extent of it for me. That's, that was the sum total of my thought process on this. I, I just think if you're good at what you do, you, you will attract people of, of all ages. So take a look at Heidi Fleiss. <laughs> and, and Tom, as someone who has been in this business for some decades now, um, do you think that the trend of always focusing just on young, young, young has been a little bit misguided? Well, I'm not going to say that, that going young is misguided. 
but what I, I think the trend not only has been young, but the trend has been funny. And through the conversations that I've had with these folks here, uh, to me it would be folly for CBS, and I said this to Howard Stringer, and I said it to Robert Morton and Peter Lasalle, that whoever took this assignment, whoever it was going to be to do this, to try and put a comedian on, a young comedian, after David Letterman, to do comedy, when this man has just done the most successful and best produced late night comedy show currently on television and possibly in its history, with the singular exception of The Tonight Show, would be stupid. I mean, who would, co who would come on and try and top what David Letterman has done? Any more than when I followed Johnny Carson, I would come on and try to top what Johnny Carson did. So I, f I felt that whoever did this, it ought to be somebody who was a broadcaster, somebody who that if something happened in the middle of the night, uh, be it a tragedy involving uh, earthquake, fire, or famine, be it something in the politi political arena involving uh, the President of the United States or the Queen of England or the Pope of Rome, there ought to be somebody there, be he or she, young or old, who could handle that kind of an assignment and keep, keep the program up and running until such time as CB News, CBS News or CB News would, would or would not carry. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm saying, but I'm just doing the best I can here. And so when you say younger, you're also talking maybe funnier. I, I don't think anybody questions the age of, of uh, Mike Wallace on, on uh, 60 Minutes, or Morley Safer yeah, on what, 60 what, Minutes. He's like 100, isn't he? Wallace is about 100? Yeah, 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 How yeah, old is that son yeah, of a bitch? Yeah. My <laughs> God. Oh, he's ancient way beyond you and me. I mean, you and me put together, he's older. And I mean, one of the funniest things that David Letterman did on his show at NBC, in which he continued here at CBS, uh, and how old is Calvin DeForest, the actor? No one Larry no Bud Melman. And, and I mean, every young person in America thought Larry Bud Melman was one of the funniest and hippiest, the hippest things they'd ever seen. And nobody said, well, geez, that guy's too old for the part. So, I mean, those are just some thoughts I have on that. But what do you think? <laughs> well, I can say that as somebody in the 30-something set, I'm thrilled because I'm glad to know that experience counts for something and that, you know, people aren't well, blind to that. You're very kind. Thank you. How do you think your audience will differ from Dave's audience? I don't think it will. I don't think it'll differ at all. I, I think that uh, a lot of people are going to be surprised, and I might be sticking my foot in my mouth here, but then again, I've built a pretty good career doing that. But I think a lot of people who appreciate the quality of what David Letterman brings to the 1130 period, and I mean, we're going to try and do a quality show of which this network and this man can be very proud. You know, this will hopefully not be a dog and pony act, but I think that whatever the age of the viewer and whatever their demographic, co demographic consequence, I think they appreciate what's good. And I think they can identify what's good and what's, you know, if it's bad, they're not going to watch it. No matter how old I am or how old they are or what he does, if it's bad, it'll go away real fast. But we don't intend for it to be bad. And I think, they, I think the audience that David Letterman delivers to us, we will in the, in the main keep. That is, that is certainly our intent. I think what Tom is saying here is we're shooting for nursing homes. <laughs> have you, one last thing, have you thought about who you might... Are you going to be this helpful then? <laughs> what time will the Daily Call come in, Dave? I mean, <laughs> Tom, in referring to shooting for nursing homes, how will you, uh, will you make a conscious effort to go for a different audience than Conan O'Brien? No. We will, we, will, we will make every attempt to go after the available audience from wherever it comes at 12.35 at night. Now, how many people are there in the country? 250, 60 million people. And how many people would you guess, Dave, watch the Conan O'Brien, the late night show over there at, uh, over there at NBC? About half that. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey. Hey. I'm not very good with demographics. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> you, know, you know, Dave, if that's the case, we do have a problem. You know that. Yeah. <laughs> but let's say, just for the sake of conversation, that five million homes watch the, 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 the program on NBC, Conan O'Brien, who, incidentally, I'm interviewing later tonight on CNBC. And that leaves... 245 million that are not watching that program. I mean, we will settle for... Uh, <laughs> did you just crack your nose? What's the matter? Are you getting on your nerves already? <laughs> God almighty. First, don't correct me, and now, now this, for God's sake. So we will, we will attempt to gear this program to whatever available audience there is at 12.35 at night. That's you, you know what, uh, I'll try and... Including the nursing homes. I, I'll, I'll try and express my feelings on this, whether you're interested in them or not. M my feeling is that uh, Conan O'Brien has done a very nice job uh, carving uh, out for himself a, a, a really well-produced, very entertaining...
television program, and, and I think that he deserves, he and the people that he works with certainly deserve a lot of credit. Uh, and because they have established themselves there, we feel like we can do just exactly the same thing with Tom Snyder and a different form of a show. So it's just another option, and, and we feel as good as Conan's show is for what they are doing, Tom is proven that his show will, will be as good, if not better. So we're, I, I couldn't be more happy with that situation um, regarding uh, the opposition here. Much better. You said money's not important, but uh, how much is the unimportant money involved? Uh, let's see. You announced last night you're making what four fifty when you had how much? I, cle I clear four fifty. Yeah. At the end so of the week. And you've been here a year, so I'm, I'm getting three and a quarter. Yeah. But there are Christmas bonuses. Tom. <laughs> You know, if you couldn't got, could have gotten some of this funny stuff in the NFL presentation, we might not have this situation. Oh. Tom? <laughs> Tom, who will be your next producer? Uh, that is still to be determined. Uh, Tom, is CNBC letting you out of your contract a month early then? Uh, we have had some conversations with them, and they have, uh, they have agreed to a, an early release. I run with them through the 25th of January, 1995, and uh, with a, with a mid-December, is that basically what we're talking about? <clears throat> we will get as close to that as possible, but again, as I said before, Mr. Ailes and uh, Mr. Rogers and the people there have been extremely uh, understanding about this and very supportive about this, and so I would anticipate that, yes, I will leave CNBC about a month six weeks before my contract expires. Uh, Dave, besides Tom's much publicized insouciance, uh, what else do you think it is that makes him a, a good host for a late night program? Well, I, I think I, I tried to highlight my, uh, what I found appealing about Tom, and, and uh, at the risk of uh, covering old ground again, I, I just have had many, many experiences both on his current effort at CNBC, uh, also on the radio show that he did, and also on the Tomorrow Show, where regardless of the guest, regardless of the topic, regardless of the circumstances, what you could rely on night in and night out was that Tom was going to be entertaining, uh, inter entertaining in, in, a, in a news fashion, entertaining with his knowledge of current events and uh, political circumstances around the world, uh, or just entertaining as being kind of a guy that you sort of liked watching late at night. Uh, that's the one thing I couldn't have more confidence about. Uh, I, f I find what Tom does the high end of it and the low end of it to always be entertaining. And, and goodness, how, how many folks uh, are there out there about whom that can be said? Um, two questions, or questions on two different levels. Uh, a, what are we looking at at clearances at this point? Is, any, is everybody who's going to take, is everybody who's got crime time now going to take Snyder automatically? And there, there's a sort of back-end reference to the radio thing, and then I'd like to know if, uh, if Mr. Schneider will have um, Mr. Stern on as his first guest after the performance last night. Well, I wouldn't have any objection to that. I, you know, what you have to understand about uh, Howard Stern, and it's a pity he couldn't be here tonight. <laughs> Guess what, Tom? <laughs> I can't speak to clearances. That has to come from Peter or from uh, Howard or... It's going to be a, somewhat over 70% clearance rate. Um, and, and as you know, we, we don't even have our entire station lineup thanks to the interchange of affiliates that is going along, uh, rather like the Battle of Bosworth Field here. And, um, and of that, a percentage will be live. Obviously, all our stations, will all our owners will carry it. And um, it will start off it started off with a slightly lower clearance than David Letterman, but he's made mincemeat of the projections that were uh, offered at the time, so I, we're not especially worried about it. Obviously, there are, there are sh in order to make room for David Letterman live, some affiliates have put their mashes and their half-hour shows behind David Letterman, and that they will bridge into Tom Snyder, but, uh, I, and that will continue for a while, given existing contracts. We understand that. But we'll, we'll be very happy with the 70% clearance rate, 70% uh, uh, and counting. And, and what is the radio arrangement? Radio arrangement is, that, is as Tom said, that it will be, it will be uh, uh, 
uh, it, it would help to have the li West Coast live. In order for West Coast to be live, Q and A, uh, we'll have to we'll have to create a radio link for the for the questioning. We haven't done that yet, so you'll have to wait for further word. The other thing I'd say about clearances, if I may, just say, just to, to, answer, to answer your question about clearances. Uh, when we went on the air with the Tomorrow Show in 73, I think we had something like 115 or 120 stations out of 208 that were NBC Prime affiliates at that time. And within 18 months to 24 months, if my memory is correct, we were up to about 196 or 197 out of a possible 208. So again, if you do something that attracts not only audience, but attracts advertisers and is therefore profitable for the stations to carry in terms of compensation, they will carry it. And when I started radio for ABC in 1987, I think we started with 103 or 104 stations, and within a year we had 256 because it was demonstrated that it would bring audience, and therefore, I mean, the name of the when they say it's not the money, it's the money. If uh, if you get uh, if you generate revenue and and ratings, stations will carry the program. So I I really have no fear uh, to support what Howard said about this improving as we go along once we get it going. Well, I mean, it, it was my intention when I first talked, and, and the funny thing about this, you, you know, when you talk about when all this started, I think uh, Bob Morton was still at NBC, were you not? When you called me one day and said, you know, if David goes to CBS at some point, he would want to do another program, and would you, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, yeah, I said, you know, what might be interesting is to do it live and simulcast it on CBS radio. When we put Tomorrow on the air in the 70s, there was some thought then to simulcasting it on NBC radio, which at that, that time was in place. Now that radio network is bifurcated and, and it's gone. A lot of it's owned by Westwood One. But it, it just seemed to me to be a neat idea to do a show uh, late at night that people could watch if they were at home or if they were on the beach in Hawaii with a transistor radio, they could listen to it. Or if they were driving on the freeways in San Francisco, they could listen to it. And then with the success that we've had at CNBC and that talk radio demonstrated and brought to television in the 1992 campaign when the world wanted to call Ross Perot and talk to him on the phone, I thought, you know, we could simulcast this on radio and television, which has not been done before by a network late at night, and then throw in the 800 number. You know, it might just really generate some excitement on, on, on broadcast. So that was the thinking behind it. Now, how you get the radio network in place uh, it, it is, is not my purview, but I'm sure there are people who know how that can be done. Three, three questions, Mr. Snyder. Is this, um, first of all, is this a four-year contract? I heard this is a four-year contract. I, I, I can't. Who am I speaking to, please? Is this a four-year oh, con four contract? Um, how long will the show run? Is it 90 minutes, and will you invite Madonna? <laughs> uh, the, the, the four years is correct, and it's a one-hour program. <laughs> Speak to the producer. Tom? Yes, ma'am. I'm over here. Oh. I just wanted to ask you, besides all the business negotiations and all the details you had to take care of, was there a point when you really felt kind of, uh, I hate to be sappy, but emotional or moved that Letterman had sort of come full circle and wanted you for this? How could you not be? How could you? You know, I, uh, and I don't want to get corny about this. Go ahead. But, uh, but, uh, you know, as I said to, uh, to Howard Stringer when I had lunch with him that day, I said, you know, whichever way this goes, it's okay with me, because I'm, I'm pretty happy in what I do. You know, I do my little TV cable show, and I live my life and kind of walk around with a smile on my face because I am amazed at the wonder of it all. And, I mean, folks, you know, if, if I had set out a year ago to have this night as a goal in my life, you want to know what the chances are in getting this done. I mean, zero, zero, zero. If you go out and say, I'm going after a 12:35 show on CBS and I'm going to get Letterman to help me. And so it's not that I get emotional, but I sometimes think to myself that any second now the alarm clock is going to go off and I'll wake up and this will be a very, very pleasant dream. I mean, when you think about the odds on this and, and, and the serendipity of this, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite something. And it's, it, it makes me happy. And what makes me so happy is not that I'm going to do this, because that, that this, after all, is just the labor that I do just to enjoy my life. But the kindness that the ladies and gentlemen of the press have showed to me and to this idea over the last six months, and again, there, there are people who are going to think that this is the most stupid idea in the world, and they're allowed to say that. You know, like I say to the people who watch me on CNBC, you know, if you think I'm full of crap, that's okay, but, you know, you, you know just call and tell me. But for all, <laughs> and they do, and, and just
just to, to read these articles that, that you folks have written saying, you know, that's not a bad idea, has really been a kick for me. And, and, and as I said before, I really thank all of you for that, even those who thought it was a, a crummy idea. I did you did you officially kind of thank David Letterman in some private moment? Yes. Um, yes. 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 I, I, I get the idea here is not to correct Dave. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the difference between what I what I do now at CNBC, in which I've enjoyed immensely, and and I intend to bring the same same attitude to CBS because this is only television, and it's only 27 inches diagonal, and I do not cure sick people, nor do I feed hungry people. But at CNBC, there was a joke because we've been lucky over there, and people watch the show, and it's popular on the network. That around CNBC, the keywords are Tom wants. From this day forward, the key words are Dave wants. No, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Dave, uh, I, I'm sort of curious whether when you did the uh, Larry Sanders show. Oh, look, show. it's Phil Donahue, ladies and gentlemen. Stand up, Phil. Nice to see you. Good to have you here. You know, are you still electrocuting people over there on that show? <laughs> that is the first time I've heard that joke today. Um, Anyway, um, <laughs> I think so. Yeah, yeah. they did the book, didn't they? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I heard there's uh, a sequel coming. Uh, I think so. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if it was an, was it an accident that the Larry Sanders show came up with this plot for you picking Tom, or was that did you add to that? Did you suggest that to them? I, I think that it was their idea, and uh, it, it is sort of odd that uh, whenever we filmed that, which I guess now is the better part of a year ago, that uh, it has come to pass. Um, so it, it's it's sort of a nice little thing to what have on record. What do you think at the time? Do you think this is really bizarre? They came up with this plot that actually. No, is in my it head. never struck me as being bizarre. And, I, and I'll tell you something here, quite honestly. If you can stand a little honesty, Carter. <laughs> I've read that crap you've been chewing out for years, buddy, and I'm tired of it. <laughs> Lousy rag you work for. Uh, no, I'm ashamed. Uh, I, you know, sitting here uh, listening to Tom talk very sincerely, very earnestly, uh, reminds me just exactly of why it is I've always enjoyed him as a presence. I mean, it's just a guy who's smart and knows what he's doing and is very good at it. And to me, you know, I don't care if he's a hundred. And, he, and he's close, by the way. <laughs> T Tom, uh, are you going to change your uh, look, uh, your hairstyle? Or? You change your look, pal, who said that? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting a little hot now. <laughs> Forgive me. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, the answer is no. No. Yeah. Um, uh, we've been writing about this for months. What, what took so long? Was it money? Did you have trepidations about doing it? Was it ever in danger of not happening? Um, I don't think so. I, I truly don't think so. And it, it really didn't take that long. I mean, there was a certain period of time that I had to use to receive permission from my management at CNBC to have these conversations because I am under contract and that took a considerable amount of time. Then we entered a period of time uh, where people were on vacation, summertime. The time changed between the East Coast and the West Coast. Uh, and Well, we are 21 hours behind out there, you know. And to tell you the, the God's honest truth, and I'm probably going to get in trouble with the management, what, what, you know, what's the difference? Uh, this all could have been done here at this theater a couple, two weeks ago, but people were on vacation and we wanted to wait till everybody was back from vacation to have everybody here that should be here. So that, I mean, just stupid stuff like that is what has been holding this up. And by the way, for all of you who've called me to, to get a comment, I, I'm sorry if I didn't return your call or if I ducked you or, or hid from you, but this, after all, was not my party nor my announcement to make. This was Mr. Stringer's and, and, and David's. And so I was bound by their time frame. So if I didn't return your calls, I, I, I apologize. And uh, I will work to improve upon that now that this is done. He's a big man. It's a big deal. Write that. Put that in there. Put that in your little story. <laughs> Tom. We, we, did try, we did try to get it for the, the press tour. But David, we, we'd screwed David on his last vacation. And I didn't really want to prevent him from his, the vacation he was having during the press tour. Yeah, so that, that was time. part Look of the Look out for that. Look out for that. Sure. Uh, yeah. we'll do, we do that a lot. We do that a lot. But the yeah, truth is, we offered him the job. We offered him the job on a, in April. I offered him after the lunch. I told him it was, it was his. 
I mean, it's David. David already told him anyway. So as you can see, as you can see, it's a year-long conspiracy. So fat difference I make. You know? <laughs> Was money a sticking point, though? Not to me. To your agent, perhaps? Oh, very good agent. Tom, have you thought about whom you might like as guests for the first couple of shows? No, I really haven't. I mean, this, we, we, you know, we're announcing the show tonight, and that's, uh, that's a little bit premature. When will you stop doing this? Uh, I don't have a stop date for that yet. That's still, we're still having conversations with CNBC, and they, they have said that they will attempt to find a replacement for, 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 for myself, and as soon as they do, then we can proceed to set a stop date there. By the way, who would you recommend now that we've got this done? Who, who, who should we get to replace me at CNBC? Dave Moore. <laughs> <laughs> Will this show be very similar to the Tomorrow Show? Well, the Tomorrow Show was the 70s and this is the 90s. I mean, I, I, I'll be similar to me then because I'm just about the same person as I was at that time. But the look will be different because the look of television is different. The graphics are different. The lighting is more heightened. Uh, the, the, the set, as you see here, has great 3D effect and great, tech, you, you notice this, Dave? Yeah. Uh, technology to it. And, and we will attempt to replicate something of the look of late night America, but it, rather than being a, a, a piece of celluloid or a scrim, hopefully we'll have a little bit more definition. You know what I like about the, uh, the Tomorrow Show and also to uh, a certain degree the, the CNBC show? On the Tomorrow Show, you really got the feeling that you were up late and it was just you and it was just Tom and Tom was the only man up functioning and working at the network and if something was going to happen, Tom would let you know about it. And it, uh, I, I still find that impression or that illusion uh, very appealing and I, I, w I would hope, but it's completely up to Tom, that they you know, work toward recreating that. He wanted to do some kind of dance party deal, and I said. <laughs> oh, stop it. Um, have you had any better luck with your, your new teller card? Oh, my charge card? No, your bank teller card that you recently got. Yeah, exactly right. Where I can't get, get, where I can't get out more than 40 bucks at a time. Yeah. I found a way to get up to 200 bucks a day. <laughs> 200 a day. <laughs> you know, a guy saw me in line the other night at Kennedy when I came in from uh, Chicago. And I, I mentioned this last night. You know, you check in two bags on, on the plane, and you check them in at the exact same time, and then they, they come to the baggage area 45 minutes apart. I don't know how that happens between here and Chicago, but it did. So this guy says to me, he says, geez, he says, you know, he says, you're, you're a big star. You have to stand here in line at the baggage. I says, you know, we're only big stars when we're sitting here. When we get to Kennedy at the baggage line, we're like everybody else. It's catch as catch can. But I, have you ever wondered, I mean, how, how, does, how does the baggage get separate? <laughs> and, you Tom, know, save this for the new show, buddy. <laughs> I already used it last night. <laughs> And, 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 and it's the same with the teller machine. The teller machine only knows that uh, my number is whatever it is, and I have a $200 a day limit just like everybody else. You know, it's, you know, stuck with it. And I can go a long way on 200 a day because, <laughs> as you tell, I don't spend a lot on wardrobe or haircuts. So, you know, there you go. Yes, Dave, sir. Yes. Dave, what, right here, what kind of uh, creative uh, input will you put to the show? Well, if, if honestly, if Tom thinks that I might be of some use to him, then I would try. But, but I believe uh, and have great confidence in the notion that he's pretty much self-contained, uh, self-motivated, and self-starting. So I w would not be as presumptuous as to, to force my little nickel and dime ideas on Tom. On the other hand, if there's something that can come from the team that has launched this program, the most successfully launched late-night program in the history of television, in my view, it'd be pretty stupid of me to say, no, I don't want that help. So if, if we need assistance and help, not just so much from Dave, but from Peter LaSalle and Robert Morton, it'd be kind of dumb not to say, hey, what do you guys think? All right, then do something about the hair. <laughs> it's a joke, right? Say it's a joke. It's a joke, it's a joke. It's a joke, it's a joke. It's a joke. It's a, just a joke. <laughs> Why was Howard Stern on so long last night? That's right. Tom, you, um, you say you, hello, Tom, 
you say I'm sorry, but I can't see anybody else. right here. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, you say you haven't changed, but the perception is that you've mellowed uh, since the Tomorrow Show. Do you think that's true? And uh, when did you interview Howard Stern? I interviewed Howard Stern when I filled in for Bob Costas on Later about three years ago over at NBC. And, and that interview, if you watch it, is talk wrestling. Because we, we went all through it, Sturm and Drang, and he kept giving the, the 800 number. Does he ever do that with you where he gives the 800 number for the tapes that the FCC would not let you hear? No, he's pretty well behaved with us. Tom. Yep, well, <laughs> then maybe the medication has taken effect by the time he gets here. But in any event, um, that interview was, was staged. It, it, it was set up. Uh, in the breaks, he and I were very cordial, and uh, believe me, I bear him no malice. I think that he's an outstanding broadcaster, and uh, whether or not he should be on the air should, is, is, in my view, not the business of the FCC, but then again, I didn't come here tonight to talk about Howard Stern. And I forgot the other part of the question. Oh, mellowed. Um, <laughs> I, guess, I guess not. Um, you know, some years back, in, a, in, a, in, in another singular attempt to destroy my career, I allowed a poster to be erected here in New York with my picture on for Eyewitness News, and they put words there like he's caustic, he's controversial, he's bombastic, he's, he, he's New York, you okay? <laughs> he's, he's New York. In other words, not only do we tell all of New York that I was unmanageable and a son of a gun, but we also said if you live in New York, you're as bad as this guy is. And all of a sudden, that created a persona of me being all those things I just said. And when I did the late night show for NBC, a lot of stuff was written about that, and, and I, I got hung with the label. And now I come back on CNBC, and people say, well, he's mellowed. Well, it's just that they're no longer writing the things about me and putting up the billboards on all the subway stops in New York that they used to put up about me. And the second part of it is, I, I've mellowed to the extent I don't judge people anymore. How the hell can I judge all these people that were in Watergate that we did on The Tomorrow Show 20 years ago? You know, when Nixon said, go do this, I guess you probably have to go do it if the president says, go do it. And so in that sense, yeah, I'm not judgmental. I can't judge other people's actions and come down on them for what they did. That's, that's for them to do. Okay, folks, that'll be it. Thanks. Oh, no, come on. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. But, you know, there, there's a, I, I, and I don't mean to embarrass Tom here, and, and there's a great story, and maybe you can fill in the blanks for me about this. When you worked at Channel 7, you were suspended. Tom was like the anchor man on the 11 o'clock news, and Tom was suspended because he gave somebody the finger. And I said, that's the kind of anchor man we want. <laughs> is, that, is that true? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what was it like? Thanks for watching. Good night, everybody! <laughs> Good news to everybody out there today! <laughs> the hell was that? <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow! <laughs> and now here's Spencer with the sport! <laughs> and then, thank God, you know, Prozac, and so we're all... <laughs> oh, Jesus! <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> Was it just a joke? Or? Just a little joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, I just got steamed at the stage manager. He kept sliding me over, and I, you know, gave him one of those. We're, free, we're number one. You know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, on that note, I think we will no, end no, it. come Thank on. You. Let's stay up really late. What's going on here? Do we have more questions for Mr. Snyder? Or Mr. Letterman? Or Mr. LaSalle or Mr. Morton? Or Mr. Stringer? How about this guy? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear you. I don't know the answer to that question because we haven't gotten that far. I would just assume that if something on, in that time frame happens that is significant, we would have to react to it. But in no way would what I do intrude upon the efforts of the, of the CBS News Department to cover uh, uh, breaking news. Yeah, and, and this is certainly not my domain, but speaking on behalf of uh, viewers, I, I think you would feel completely comfortable and confident if that came to pass with Tom, is my feeling. Anyway, folks, thanks for all you wrote, wrote about us and for coming over tonight. And um... Come on, Tom. All time sake, give him the finger. Just once. Come on. <laughs> Come on, Tom. Give me all... <laughs> I've been there, Pat. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, folks. Thanks.
Thanks, Peter.